Checking connection. You're now live. Okay. Let's check the sound on everybody. The microphone there. Here's the microphone for YouTube. Maybe I better put that up closer. Okay. All right. We're here. We're just waiting for other people to show up. And I know last time we had a problem with Facebook. So I'm here. That's working. All right. So if anybody's watching, sorry for the, uh, you know, technical trying to figure out. I'm a little bit late because I couldn't figure out how to go live on Instagram. Okay, so here we are. If anyone is uh, following us, so I'm waving to all the people on Instagram, they're coming in first. Uh, welcome, so I'm hoping that you guys are following. Let's give it a little light, because it's a little dark. Ah, here we go. If you guys are following my workshop, which is the Drawing Path Workshop, uh, this is going to be the response to lesson number two that I released yesterday. Uh, lesson number one was gonna talk about form and talked about you know holding the sticks. Let's get a better camera angle here. Let me move it a little closer. It'd be nice if you guys could see the pad. I don't know if that's going to happen, but close enough. And that's driving me nuts that I hear rattling. I don't know why it was rattling. Okay. Anyways. All right. Beautiful. Okay, so we are talking about technique in this one. This one's going to actually break down the three basics, basics of technique if you had been through some of the Q&A um, for the first time we talked about form. This time we're going to be talking about more of the technique that encompasses all of studying drums and getting better. So I don't know if anybody has gone through that, but if I can get in. Well, you're commenting. <laughs> That's Gabriel. You said you can't get in. You can't get in where? On Instagram? I couldn't get in on Instagram either. It makes you feel better. It took me forever to figure out how to go live. I couldn't find the live button anywhere. I was searching for like almost 10 minutes. <laughs> oh, I gotta love technology. It's a beautiful thing. And this sound is driving me crazy that something's rattling on this drum. But these lugs are loose. I'm gonna tighten them up a little bit. Alright, anyways. Okay, so getting back into it, we are talking about technique, we are talking about the three basics of technique, which is gonna be rhythm, accents, and sticking. All right, if you break drums down to its barest minimum, those are the three categories that we break it down to. So everything in drums breaks down to those three categories. So if you're gonna get yourself into a practice head for really studying drums, the trick is going to be to iron out and understand what's important inside of all those three categories. Uh, now, when I give a lesson for the first time, the first thing I ask to every student is to define rhythm. Uh, and you'd be amazed how many people this stumps. Uh, so anybody watching right now, if you're watching this, just think to yourself, you had to define rhythm. Hey, Glenn, how you doing? Oh, is that Glenn? Oh, I thought it was Glenn. It's Gian, Gian? It's not Glenn. Okay, sorry. Hi, welcome. <laughs> um, if you had to define rhythm, how would you define it? Now, most people automatically will say the beat, and that's the trap, okay? That's the trap I try to get students into when they come to me for lessons. Rhythm and beat are two different things. So as a drummer, we have to understand the difference between those two, uh, and that distinction is really, really important. Uh, then we, we also talked about accents, accents being your louds versus your soft, uh, and what the reason is for accents, why you need to, to work on it, and what it does for the sound. Now, all this stuff, if you guys follow me, is also part of my Drumming Foundation Challenge, which is on my website. So that's also free. Anybody here that's taking my workshop could go to the Drummer's Almanac and take my challenge. It's, a, it's like 10 videos, and it takes about a half hour to go through the whole thing. But it's going to really grill you on what you know in terms of foundation and how to 
get in and out of all of these different categories. So definitely something you should do. Uh, okay, so before I get crazy with any of this stuff, I don't want to pretty much re-give the lesson that's already in the, the workshop. Does anyone that watched the workshop have any questions? So I'm, gonna, I'm looking right now. Uh, I don't see any questions happening on Facebook yet. Facebook is the one that's giving me problems from the technical standpoint. How do I see? I don't care about my insights. I care about comments. Where are the comments on this? I again, don't know how this stuff works with Facebook. And this is my problem with all these social medias. Like, this is overcomplicated. This sh it should, YouTube's got it the best. YouTube's just got a screen, and it would be nice if it showed comments here too, but I'm not seeing anybody here as well. So, I don't know if you just tap it. We're going to figure this out as we go along. So I apologize for any of the technical snafus here. <laughs> I don't really know what I'm doing, and this is the second time I'm going live, so just still trying to figure all this stuff out. Okay, so I'm here on Facebook, and I'm looking for dashboard. Okay, where is comments? How do I see where people are commenting? Comment moderator, not set. Comment of Jeremy Romax. Yeah, I'm testing. Put a test comment in, see if I can see anything. Okay, so that's the comments, I guess, down there. All right, uh, that's gonna be how it goes. All right, good. So, we got a question here on Instagram. It says, my dad used to, to drum a lot, but I have no idea how to. <laughs> uh, he's taught me a little. Can you give me a little tips before I get a drum set? Okay, so the first thing you're going to do before you get a drum set is get yourself a pad. You know, you want to get definitely one of these deals, all right? Because that's going to be where you're going to start. I mean, before you even worry about a drum set, if you can't make one surface sound like something, you have no business moving to a million different sound sources and trying to make it happen. It is fun, and there's nothing wrong with getting on a kit and learning how to play a beat and doing all that stuff. But if you're going to really study the drums, you want to get into some bad work. Be awesome to set up yourself up with some lessons. Get a great teacher that's going to show you what to do uh, and work on the pad first. Again, knowing your foundation. I'm all about foundation. For me, it's, it's understanding from the start what's important so you don't go through some of the stuff that I went through. Uh, if anyone's gone through my workshop or seen my bio or anything, I went through a lot of hell when I was studying drums, okay? Uh, and I don't like, want any of my students to have to go through any of that same type of stuff. Uh, so it's understanding the foundation, understanding what's important. Again, I'm talking to you if you can define rhythm. Drums is all about rhythm. We're all about keeping time. So you have to know the difference between what is rhythm, what is beat. You know, understanding those things are so fundamental but they're very glazed over, not just by drummers, but by all musicians. So many, so many musicians have no idea. Um, I was in the car with uh, my keyboard player on the way to a gig this past Saturday, and, uh, and I told him that. I said, you know, can you, as a piano player who went to college and studied music, can you define rhythm in musical terms? And he had a hard time doing it. He was like, oh, no one's ever asked me to do that. I mean, I kind of know what it is, but I've never had to actually define it. So you should know what that is, and that's going to that's help you out. So definitely join my, my site in terms of the uh, at least getting on the mailing list, taking that challenge. It's going to help give you a clear idea of where to start. Um, then get yourself a pad. You know, start working on some of the basic rhythms, some of the basic accent possibilities, and some of the sticking combinations like rudiments. That's going to be a great place to start. Um, and of course, you know, listening to music and you know, hooking yourself up with other players or a great teacher is going to be invaluable. So that's, that's where I'd go with that. Um, anybody else got anything before I uh, continue rambling? I see a lot of people join here on Instagram, so I'm waving to everybody. Hey, everybody. Oh, is that my Aunt Gloria that just joined? Hey, Aunt Gloria. <laughs> That's awesome. You taking a drum lesson? <laughs> awesome. That's very cool. All right, so I'm hoping that this is working here on... YouTube. Can someone do me a favor and shoot me a comment on YouTube and let me know if the sound is good? You can hear me? Because I just don't know. It's hard for me to tell. I'm trying to set up a little microphone here just so it's working. So the way I'm doing this right now is I have three different devices going. So I have one on YouTube, one on Facebook, and one on Instagram. So that's, that way I can moderate all the comments at once. I know there's a better way to do this. Uh, okay, good. Sounds good. Sounds good. Any buzz roll tips? So buzz roll is actually a great, um, a great one to ask about. Uh, same thing before I get into that. Uh, Facebook. I know last time we had a problem with the mic on Facebook, and it was I muted the actual hardware. So 
I didn't realize I did that, but that's what I had done. So hopefully you guys on Facebook could hear me as well. Uh, okay, so buzz roll. Buzz roll is going to be the same vibe as any other kind of sticking thing. All right, so when I talk about a roll, I talk about it from the fulcrum. That's the most important thing because that's your fulcrum. Now, if you notice the way I do it, and you don't have to do this, a lot of guys will use the front fulcrum. I tend to use the middle finger. It's a little bit more balanced. It's the center part of your hand, if you see that. You know, so if I put my hand up like this, you notice if you follow a straight line from your elbow, the center part is your middle finger, not your index finger. So that kind of puts you off on an angle if you do it like that. So that's why I tend to like the balance of the middle finger. Having the index on top and then the other fingers curled around, it makes this little triangle. You see this? If I go one, two, three, it makes a little triangle. And that's kind of where the crux of my fulcrum sits. All right? From there, that's my bounce. And I never hold tight. Okay? I never squeeze. Like that, you notice there's no tension when I pull that out. That's how it feels all the time. I try my best to always keep that, the place where the fulcrum comes from. Okay? The next thing you work on is just getting that fulcrum to really come back. Okay? So if you notice I'm doing this and I'm practicing just smacking that stick up, starting here, and I whack it up. Starting here, and I smack it up. This is just teaching me how to find that fulcrum without, you know, using my wrist or flinging it back. It's just the idea that the stick is going to come up by itself off the pad. See that? Okay. Why, the reason I'm doing all this is I'm trying to figure out the rebound energy. Okay? That's the energy coming off the head. I come down, the stick rebounds back up. And how do I control that energy? What do I do with that energy once it hits the head and rebounds back? And the answer is you, you have control over that. And I use the analogy, like I said in the last slide, of turning on a faucet. All right? So as soon as you hit that pad, it's like you're turning on a faucet and letting all this energy out. Okay? Now you have to decide how much of an energy flow you want or how much of a water flow you want. So the more you tighten or close that faucet, the less energy you're going to have. So basically, you control that valve by your back fingers, back here. You see that? Again, I'm using my middle finger most of the time. So I'm, I'm going to mostly use my ring and my pinky to kind of close the faucet. So I'm just kind of letting that in and out. And if I let it out a lot, all the way, for example, it does a, all the energy and I get that. If I let it out half the way, it's going to rebound back and forth across my fingers and my palm. And I get that. Again, I'm not squeezing that fulcrum, if you notice. If I really close it, like tight, not squeezing, but just enough to not let any energy out, I control it. We call that a control stroke because I'm stopping that rebound. I'm controlling the energy. But if I let it out a tiny fraction, I buzz. And that's going to be my buzz roll. Now, that's a buzz roll coming from the back, not from the front. Other guys will teach you how to squeeze the top and push. Okay? Doing this. That's not wrong. It's, there's nothing really wrong with that except for the fact that you're using tension to get a buzz. The buzz can be very clean. You can do this. There's no right or wrong. This is more a matter of how it feels to you. For me, I never like that because it, put you in, it puts me in this tense position. I don't like to feel tension when I'm doing a buzz roll. I want to be nice and relaxed. So I can loosen up that fulcrum and get all the bounce from controlling that valve from my back fingers, if that makes any sense. That's the way I teach it, that's the way I do it. And when I'm playing things like second line or jazz, and I have to do a really nice buzz roll into a swing, I don't want to have tension. I don't want to be squeezing and scratching into that roll. All right, so that's the most important thing to understand with any kind of roll is the, the fulcrum relationship and you having control of that rebound energy. All right, good. Anybody have any other questions? Let's see if I missed anything while I was rambling. You're on Instagram. Uh, anything here? Hey guys, peace. All right, good. How about Facebook? Do we have anybody on Facebook joining us? I don't know because I can't see anything on Facebook. It's not showing me anybody. All right, what about YouTube? Anybody else on YouTube here? I wish I could figure out how YouTube would show me all of the questions. Top chat, some chat. Okay, live chat. There it is. Okay, we're back. Okay, you sound good. Buzz roll tips. Comment check. Good, thank you. Okay, you guys are in there. Hopefully it'll stay like that. That would be good if those comments stay up there. Okay, good. 
<laughs> okay, so going back to what we were talking about with the, uh, with the workshop, the workshop at this point is just about defining technique, okay? Um, the next one on Sunday, we're going to release on Sunday, is going to get into the nitty-gritty of kind of practicing technique. Um, so a couple more questions over here. Independence while playing jazz. Okay, can you demo the left hand? Uh, clarify that for me, Dr. Strange. Uh, what do you want with the left hand? Are you talking traditional? Buzz roll on traditional grip on the left hand. Okay. Yeah. Same same, same concept as the right hand. Now, if I'm playing traditional grip, if you're playing match grip, it's exactly the same. You know, you're finding that. This same full stroke thing that way. With the left hand, if you're playing traditional, it's a little different because your fulcrum is here. It's in this valley. Okay? And when I do it, when I teach a student, the first thing I teach them, if you can see that, let's see if I can angle this down a little bit, but you see that? That's your balance. That's where the stick is gonna come from. So there's your rebound energy. Now, of course, when you hit that hard, if I if I really hit that hard, it's gonna go flying out of my hand. It's gonna go flying back that way. So <laughs> you don't want that to happen. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna catch it. So see when I hit it, I feel that rebound in there, and then I catch it bringing all my other fingers up into this position. Is this hard? Yes. Is it awkward? Absolutely. Uh, is, does it feel as good as the match grip? Never. One of the shortcomings of traditional grip. All right? So you'd have to practice the heck out of it just to find that rebound. Now, as far as controlling that energy, the faucet that we talked about, if you could see this. Here, I'll do it like this. See that? Here's the stick with just letting it go. Some people bring their thumb down on it. And that controls the valve, the valve, see that? So I can actually buzz just by keeping the thumb on the stick. Again, I'm not squeezing, I'm just keeping it there. You could also do it with the index. See that? Now if I let that index up, again, I'm controlling that rebound. Notice my back fingers, that's my pinky and my ring right here, are catching it and lifting it. That's how I stop it. I stop it by literally catching it. In traditional grip. So it's these back fingers, mostly the ring finger, that just catches the stick when I'm doing an open double. So if I'm playing like this, th those bottom fingers are kind of lifting it to stop the stick, as opposed to the fingers coming from the bottom and pulling with the match grip. Again, is that completely different than the right hand? Yeah. So does it make sense to play that way? <laughs> so when a lot of people ask me about traditional grip, so I'm not a huge proponent of it. I don't teach a lot of my students that way unless, unless they directly ask me to learn traditional grip. Um, I know I play that way, and I explained in the last live, if anybody was here, that the only reason I started playing traditional grip all the time is I, I, I got beaten up in college. I had the upperclassmen, not just drummers, but I had upperclassmen and teachers kind of making fun of me that I played match grip, and you can't play jazz if you play match grip, which is a bunch of nonsense. That's not how it works at all, okay? Um, how you hold the stick has no bearing on the sound or the technique. It's going to feel different because you're coming out of that stick from a different place. It's going to feel different to you. It shouldn't sound any different to the listener. So whether you learn all your technique this way or you learn it this way, it's going to sound the same. It'll just feel different to you. So traditional grip is more a matter of how it feels. All right? uh, you also asked, someone asked about jazz coordination. Now again, that's a can of worms. Jazz coordination, people spend you know, four years in college studying jazz just to get the jazz coordination together. Uh, of course, it's the idea of keeping you know, the jazz beat and then having freedom to do anything you want with your left hand, your right foot, your left foot, and combinations in the triplets. Uh, there's a bunch of books that get you in and out of that. Uh, the main ones that I like are the Advanced Techniques for the Modern Drummer, which might be in my bookshelf over here, or it might be in my lesson room. Uh, that's by Jim Chapin. That's going to take you through all the ins and outs of the coordination, okay? Uh, another great one is Gary Chapin's Time Functioning Patterns book. Uh, that book is invaluable for jazz, and that gives you all the possibilities of the triplet. I think there's nine possibilities of triplets, permutations. I don't, I've, I've got to look it up off the top of my head. Uh, and you got to learn all of those against your hand, against the jazz beat. Uh, then, of course, there's books like John Riley's The Art of Bop Drumming, which is another great book. That's going to really get more into the swing and the history of jazz and understanding form and understanding how to think about other musicians and trading fours and vocabulary. It, that book is amazing. So those three books are my probably my initial go-to 
if I'm teaching anybody jazz. All right, so again, that's gonna be Jim Chapin's The Advanced Techniques, uh, John Riley's The Art of Bop, and Gary Chafee's Time Functioning. Those are my three go-to jazz books, if you will. Uh, and of course, there's so many more. There's so many ways of doing it. Uh, if you talk about note sources, you talk about things like that, there, there's a million things that, that you could get into. Uh, but again, all that is just technique. Um, listening, listening to jazz. Because I had pretty good technique when I got to college. I was actually pretty good with the technique. Like I, I was through a lot of those books, but I still didn't swing. And I get that all the time. Man, you don't, you don't really swing. You don't really swing. The swing is not good. The swing, I didn't know what that meant. And they weren't talking about literal swing. They were talking about uh, the feeling, the groove of the swing. They were talking about the feeling of the push of the time. And that, that you got to get from listening. You get it from technique and balance, but just listening and trying to get the jazz into your bones. You know, and it's hard for some of us that don't, didn't grow up with it. So, I mean, if you grew up your whole life with jazz, it's a different thing. Okay, hold on. My chat, why does it keep going away on YouTube? That's really, I wish it didn't do that. Okay, I love the valve metaphor. Yeah, yeah I'm <laughs> glad you like the valve metaphor. I got beaten up a lot on TikTok about that water valve metaphor. I actually threw it into the video where I actually showed a faucet. And you wouldn't believe all the shade that got thrown at me from uh, doing that. Uh, so your drum lesson breakdown, uh, Becoming by Pantera. Do you still play double bass? Absolutely. I do play double bass. I'm not a double bass player. You know, I'm not really a metal drummer. Uh, I've had to do it a couple of times. I've been in a couple of bands. Uh, a band called Cast and Shadows I was in for, for a little while years ago. Uh, they hired me. Uh, I was teaching their drummer and their drummer was having some personal problems. And they just said, hey... Uh, where would face the camera angle? Oh, sorry. Thank you, Peter. Here we go. Is that better, Pete? Yeah, let me know if that's, that's a better spot. Um, what was I just saying? Did see Pete? He interrupted me. Uh, yeah, so I was in this band, Cast in Shadows, and yeah, I was playing metal. They hired me to come and do it. I did the session for their record, and then I, I did a bunch of dates with them. Uh, and it was funny because I'm playing metal, and I was playing traditional grip, and their producer was like... Uh, can you not play traditional grip? <laughs> they gave me kind of a hard time for playing traditional grip because it looked too jazzy and not, you know, they wanted like hard hitting metal guy, you know? So that had a lot of double pedal in terms of for the metal thing. But yeah, I use double pedal for tons of exercises. Uh, even something when I was studying with Frank Bellucci, he used to make me do things like playing triplets across my feet, like ba 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 and then go through a book like Syncopation or Advanced Techniques. You know, Syncopation by Ted Reed, that's another amazing jazz book. And when I talk about note sources, that's the, note, that's the book for that. Yeah, so you have to keep a double pedal groove going in triplets, play the jazz beat with the right hand, and then read through the book with the left hand. Uh, that kind of exercise really gets your balance together. Uh, there's just things that you could do with two feet that you can't do with one foot, no matter what. You know, especially when you get to a certain speed or certain tempo. And used tastefully, double pedal does not have to be a metal thing. Just because it's associated with da, 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 pounding that out or going really fast. Uh, when I played in a band, we played a couple of dates with Dave Matthews. Uh, I had the pleasure of sitting behind Carter Beaufort, who I, I mentioned in this, uh, in this last lesson. Uh, and I got to watch him play for like two nights, like five feet away from behind him, uh, almost level with his feet because I was under the stage. And um, that guy's on the double pedal like all the time. Like 90% or maybe 85% of the time, he's on that double pedal. Not because he's playing fast double pedal stuff. He just likes the, the switch. He likes the balance of the two feet. So he just likes to split it because every note punches. He like does that between his feet while he's doing all the other stuff he's doing. It was crazy to watch. But double pedal is just a tool. It's not a style. So a lot of people look at double pedal and they automatically think metal. Double pedal is metal. I watched Bellucci play with a jazz band and do trading fours where he was, he was doing phrases with the double pedal. And it sounded like jazz. It didn't sound like rock. You know, he did. And he call and response on his feet. So there's a lot you could do with the double pedal. It just, you know, it takes a lot of development. Uh, good. Let's see. Hold on. What does it say? Why is that fade away? Don't fade away, comments. How are you supposed to do it if the comments fade away? There's got to be a setting for that. All right, let me see what this says. Uh, Louis Belson was the first double bass player, by the way. Yes, I, I have actually a poster of Louis with the big double bass kit, which I think was a little bit of a novelty. Like, I don't think he expected drumming to go in that direction so heavily with two feet, and I'm sure he never imagined 
the level of guys like Thomas Lang or that that are like the octopuses that take it to that level. Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Rock guys and metal guys should give jazz drummers credit. I mean, I think every drummer should give jazz drummers credit. You gotta remember, drum set is an American instrument. It was created for jazz in America, all right? So where every other style of drumming, which is really, really old, hey, from Costa Rica, how you doing? Um, every other style of drumming comes from hand drums, you know, comes from individual instruments. You look at all the Latin stuff, you look at the Cuban and the Brazilian stuff, African stuff, uh, even Middle Eastern stuff, that stuff all came from individual instruments uh, and was brought to the drum set. So drum set was just, the need for drum set kind of came around when it was like, instead of having to pay five guys to be, a, you know, rhythm section to play drums, it was like, well, we could pay one guy if we give him a bass drum, a snare drum, and a, you know, sock cymbal, and he could do it all with <laughs> just as his limbs. We don't need four different guys to do this. So it was kind of like built out of that necessity, and that's kind of where the drum set came from. But yeah, and of course that evolved into the jazz style, and everything evolved from jazz and straightened out to rock, and you know, it progressed from there. Uh, do you recommend to practice all the rudiments on the double bass drum? Yes, absolutely. Anything that you do with your hands, you can do with your feet, without a doubt. You know, you could certainly do it. Depends on where you want to go with it. Um, I mean, I've done those practice. I've done like the stick control book with the feet. There's some exercises I have in the drummer's almanac where I do my accent chart, the rhythm chart, all that stuff that I teach with my hands, I teach it against a basic groove. You it's just quarter notes on the ride, two and four on the snare drum, and then go through the rhythm chart with your feet. Uh, it just, it's great for your balance. It's great for just understanding, you know, where the time is with your feet instead of it always being locked to the highest giving time, the bass drum's breaking it up. So yeah, absolutely, all that stuff is great, especially if you want to develop the feet and get that independent, you know? Um, I'm good at it, I'm not amazing at it, there's, again, talk about a guy like Thomas Lang. You watch his feet, and his feet are, you know, just as strong as his hands. So he's doing stuff on top and then finishing it with his feet, and it's just part of his vocabulary at that point. Virgil Donati is like that. Uh, again, studying with Frank Bellucci. Frank's feet were just, you know, they were out of control. <laughs> so he spent lots and lots of time. I've never really had to do it to that level unless you're doing clinics and things like that. Uh, Megadeth's first drummer named, what was his name? Gar Samson? was more into jazz fusion type of drumming. You could hear it, yep. Feelings about business and business is good, yep. <laughs> See, I, yeah, I, I didn't know his name, you know? But uh, I used to listen to Megadeth back in, uh, back in high school. They were one of those, one of those for, you know, initial metal bands that I was into with Metallica and all that other stuff. And of course, Pantera was my favorite when I was a, when I was a, a kid in the 90s. You know, Vinny, Vinny was one of my favorite metal guys for that style. Um, do you remember? Oh, yep, got that one. Okay, Instagram. Let's see what we got going on here. Any questions that I missed? Okay. Nope, not, not that I'm seeing. All right, good. If anyone's got any questions, feel free to shoot them out. I'm going to do my best not to pass over you if I could. Uh, Pete, that's better. Thank you. Good. All right. And the sound is good this time, so you guys can hear me through the mic. That's <laughs> helpful. Okay, good. All right, so going back to, uh, anyone have any questions? Who's, first of all, you know, I don't know if anyone's around with any way of uh, getting through it. Uh, what advice do you have on improving your groove, timing, and feel? Groove, timing, and feel. Um, again, groove, timing, and feel. So groove is subjective. You know, groove is something that's like, you know, some people think you groove, some people think you don't. I know guys that, that love drummers. Uh, and then I'll hear somebody else say that same drummer doesn't groove. I remember having an argument with a guitar player. He was telling me that Dave Weckl doesn't groove. I, I don't like Dave Weckl. He doesn't groove. And, and again, so it could be a little bit of a subjective thing when it comes to that. But if you're looking on, you know, just really getting good with time and good with balance, uh, it's, you know, it's listening to a lot of that stuff. Because again, groove like swing is not something you can teach. It's something that the person's got to find. So listening to a lot of music that has the kind of groove you're looking for uh, and then, of course, the technique has to be there. So you're not going to groove if you don't aren't balanced, which is why I'm so focused on technique. I focus on technique because technique is a means to an end. It's not the end itself, okay? The end is groove. The end is, you know, sounding great, making the band feel great, making the time feel great, sounding interesting, having something to say, conveying emotion. That's the end. The means, the tools, is the technique. So if the technique or the tools are lousy, you know, your, your balance is going to be lousy. Your balance is lousy. The groove is going to be lousy. The time is going to be lousy. You know, so to develop balance as a rule of thumb, 
what I tell my students is when you do an exercise quickly, when you run for speed, you're building muscles, you're building endurance. You're not working on groove or time. When you go very slowly, that works on balance. That teaches your muscles how to hold back and stay inside the groove. Uh, again, going back to a lesson I took with Frank Gallucci, because Frank was amazing at technique. He, out of all my teachers, he was probably the best technician of anybody. And he'd be the first one to tell you that how much he hates technique because everyone's so into technique and they're not into playing. Yet, on the other side, he would practice technique and say, probably still does. He practices technique at, at a ridiculous level. Okay, so the whole idea is to practice so much technique that it's in the back of your brain. You don't have to think about anything. And you can just express yourself musically without worrying about any kind of technique. If you're thinking, man, I gotta do this 7A pattern with a double on the kick while you're playing, you're not gonna groove. All right, you, you just gotta be able to execute. So that, that's, that's the kind of thing you wanna talk about. Uh, but in that first lesson with Frank, uh, and this is, I was already in my 20s. So I was already through college and I was already a teacher and a, and a professional. He, uh, he said, how are you with the click? And I said, what? I said, I'm a session drummer. I said, I'm fine with the click. The click is not a problem. He said, really? So he put the click on, <laughs> he put it like on 40, 40 or 35, as low as the click would go. So we're talking like this, all right? And he had me play a jazz. He just play a ding, da, di, di, da, di, di. So I was doing that, just, just doing that. I was having, I was like, wow, this is really slow. He's like, good. He's like, now, now play quarter note triplets, but play one note on the snare drum, one note on the kick drum. Go, at this tempo. And I was like, da, uh, 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 completely falling apart. And he was like, yeah, yeah, you're not, you're not really good with the click. And that was eye-opening to me. That was very humbling especially someone that's been through college and been through all this stuff, I thought I had that together. Uh, he sat down and did it, and of course the balance was there, and it just swung, and it grew super slow, and it was just there. He's like, now you turn the click up to 80, and there's your pocket. You turn to 80, and it's like, it feels like putting on an old pair of shoes. And to me, that was an exercise in understanding balance. So balance comes from doing it really slow, and not just executing it right, making it feel good when you do it really, really slow. So that was, that's one of those techniques that I stole from Frank, and I do that with my students now. <laughs> so, uh, great question. Great question. Um, Frank is a great drummer, just like yourself. Thanks, JL. I appreciate that. Thank you. I don't shine Frank's shoes, but I do appreciate that. So, <laughs> uh, great. Let's see what else we got here. Anything on YouTube? Here's something about Greg and Matt Garska do this technique of timing. Yeah, you know, again, any, any great player learn that. They, you understand that at some point. Uh, let's see what else we got here. There's a couple here. Quite early, yeah. Uh, Paradiddles can be practiced on the double bass. Yep, uh, do it. Thomas Lang did mention it. Absolutely, you know, paradiddles on the, on the pedal are great. You know, again, something else that I used to do with Frank, he used to make me do paradiddles with the feet across the hi-hat. He wouldn't use a double pedal, he used it on the hi-hat or against like a gahate pedal, something like a wood block. Um, and he'd have me do it that way. So I get a different sound source. So when you hear the paradiddle, you didn't just hear bop, 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 you hear like bop, 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 you get that difference in sound source. Uh, and then he'd have me go through accent exercises and he'd have me go through rhythm exercises and things like that. Uh, stick control, going through sticking when you do paradiddles with the feet is very difficult, you know? So. Yeah, absolutely. All that stuff is, is amazing. Any kind of ostinato with the feet, once you get good at it, is going to make a is going to make a huge difference in just your coordination. And again, when you're doing coordination, it's about balance. So you got to go really slow and make it feel good, and you got to be able to do it fast to make it feel good. Okay, hold on. There's not one more here. Uh, there was a question earlier about uh, your take on French grip. Uh, was it that I missed that? I'm practicing rudiments on the double pedal. Let me see. Uh, there's a little bit else breakdown. Yep, thoughts on French grip. Yep, I saw that. Okay, so it says DMB drummer. DMB drums. DBM, I'm sorry, I thought it was DMB like Dave Matthews Band. <laughs> That's what I thought he was asking about French grip. No, DBM drums ask about, asked about French grip. I mean, French grip is great. There's nothing wrong with French grip. I think French grip is a great style. I don't usually play exclusively in that style. I'll do it uh, for certain things. Like when I play jazz, uh, my ride cymbal is set up in a way that the French grip just makes more sense. Okay? 
Now, French grip is not all that different from German grip, and we go about this, go through this in the first video of my workshop where I talk about the different grips. Uh, but basically, if you're in that German grip and you're here, right? So you you have this straight line, this curve here, a straight line here where this is kind of closed. You don't have this kind of stuff happening where there's a gap. I don't know if you can see that. So you do the, yeah, that. You want to close that gap and keep this kind of around the barrel like you're hugging the tree vibe. And that's your German form. Your French grip is the same thing. You're just turning on. That, that's it. That's really where the French grip is. You know, my wrist is very straight while I'm doing that. Now, what that's going to do is that's going to change the position of your drums. So this drum is actually up high. So see how I have to do this to hit it? This is no good, all right? This is putting, my, putting tension on my wrist. Do a lot of drummers play like that? Yes. Is it wrong? No. It's just you're, or you're taking a, a muscle and you're stretching it. So it's in a weak position. So now you're attacking the drums from a weak muscular position. Uh, and this is something that you guys could try. And I think I, I, might, I might do it on the, the workshop. I don't remember if I, if I recorded this or not. I think I did. But it's the idea of just putting your arm in a straight position like this and then making a fist or squeezing something. If I squeeze a stick and I do it real tight, you have a lot of strength right there. You could crush somebody's hand just from doing that. But the second you put, do, do that and then try to squeeze, you feel it's noticeably weaker. If you do this, which is what a lot of bass players and guitar players do, this is really weak if you actually twist your wrist and then squeeze. But if you're straight, this is what a jazz guitarist will do. They'll play the guitar up high, back here, you know, and that keeps the wrist straight. Versus a rock guy who plays it low because it looks cool. But they sacrifice all this strength because they're bending their wrist. Does that mean you can't get good that way? No, you can absolutely get good that way. You know, it's just you're, do, you're making it harder on yourself. You're, not, you're taking some muscles out of the equation. So with French grip, the thing I see that most mistakes that drummers make is that their form, their, their drums aren't set up in a way that accommodates the French grip. When I sat behind Carter's drum set, because he plays in that French grip, his snare drum was ungodly low to me. He sat up high, his snare drum was below his knees, um, which in a drum position you can't even hit, because you'll hit your knee before you hit the drum. So <laughs> in the French grip, you're in between your knees. So he was actually able to get in between in, and in, his knee would be up here and the snare would be down there, and he was able to get to the drum that way. The mechanics of the French grip, if I use my wrist, you see I'm twisting? It's a twist. You see? It's not, it's not this. This is terrible for your wrist. Your wrist is not meant to go sideways like that. You know, that's tendonitis city right there if you just work on that. Good French grip players know how to twist and utilize the fingers. So of course the fingers are so you're doing this. Now in this position, I have to wing out my shoulder because this drum is too high for the French grip. So I would look like this if I, if I was to play the French grip properly with a drum this high. I would lower it and then be able to lower my shoulders and I'd have to change the form of my entire drum set to play inside that French grip. I couldn't even hit uh, Carter's toms in, in this grip. It was so awkward because it's set up for this. So another thing to keep in mind with any of your grips Set up your drums around your form. Don't set up your form around your drums. A lot of drummers, and I see this with students all the time, if I go to their house and see if they're set up, a lot of students will just kind of get a drum set, set it up, and then start playing. Uh, and that's a bad order <laughs> to do it in, because then you get used to hitting the drums wherever they are in these weird positions, and you're basically training your hands to be in bad form. When the better way to do it is to sit down with nothing, with no drum set, just with a chair, Look at your form and then map out where everything needs to be based on what the kind of form you play. If you're playing German grip, you have your snare drums here, your high toms here. It should be relatively flat. You have your floor toms here. You should be able to get to it very easily. Your ride cymbal should be right there. That's where it should be. Your crashes. Now, everything peripheral might go out of form a little bit, but that's kind of how you have to set up your drums. For French grip, if you look at somebody like Travis Barker, who plays in the French grip, you know, he sits down at his drum set, his snare is going to be lower because he's inside of this. French position, so he's in between his knees. His hi-hat is very high. If you notice, his hi-hat's almost where his music stand is. So his snare's down here, there's like a little foot gap between his hi-hat and snare drum. Why? So he doesn't have to do this. He's here. Bang, 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 bang. There's his hi-hat. So he's right in there when he's playing his hi-hat. And it, it works perfectly with the form. You know, one thing I do see Travis doing is he plays his toms very flat, which does kind of tend to put him out of form, but I think it's because he's hitting very hard and using rebound when he does that. So... That's all, that's all part of what he's doing. Where Carter angled his toms. 
a lot. And that kind of lended itself to this. When he's playing around the drums, he's gonna, he has that kind of thing going. So I'm, I'm very into form. Yeah, I don't know if you guys noticed that, but I mean, that's why I did a whole lesson on it, because bad form will screw up everything else. <laughs> it'll screw up your ability to get fast. It'll put ceilings on speed. It'll do all kinds of things that will totally, totally mess you up. So yeah, form is extremely important. So if any of you have not been through my, my program, uh, at, when this is all done, I'll go ahead and I will uh, put the links on to register, because I'm going to leave this whole workshop open all week. Uh, and through the launch of the site. So what, what, what this workshop usually does, it's a precursor to me opening the doors up to my website, The Drummer's Almanac, which is a, uh, you know, it's a learning site, and it's really more devoted to practicing. So it's going to teach you just some of these basics, focusing on rhythm accents and sticking, and then take you into practice routines. Some of the guys here, I already recognize the names, are in the site. Some of them are members. Uh, we do also do a live every Tuesday. Uh, from my private Facebook group, which is guys on my mailing list and members that are in the Drummer's Almanac, where they, we talk about practicing, we talk about drums, we talk about everyone's individual goals and whatnot. Um, so this workshop is a prequel to me opening the doors. And usually I open the doors once a year. So the last time I opened the Drummer's Almanac, I think, was last August. It was not quite a year, but that was the last time I think I opened the doors. Uh, I'm trying to get to the point where I can open up more. Uh, I'm just one person though, and I run the entire show, so I do all the editing, I do all the web, I do all, <laughs> I do everything. So because I'm only one guy, it's tough to to service a lot of people, you know, which is why I open it up and then I close it and then I focus on the students that I have in there. So hopefully, if things start, you know, moving down the bench, I'll be able to get some staff to help me out, and uh, we could open it up more often and let more people in. But that's kind of where we are now. Uh, Pete, what are you saying here? Uh, will you talk about being willing to change old habits? For example, a Gleckel at a high at the height of his career working with Gruber to change his grip. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. I mean, Neil Peart, we talk about Neil Peart all the time, how he, uh, he did that Buddy Rich concert, uh, and he tells this story. He tells the story in one of those DVDs, I don't know, Anatomy of a Drum Solo, or one of those DVDs, he talks about watching Steve Smith uh, at Soundcheck with the Buddy Rich band and just being blown away by what Steve was doing. Now, Steve is a trained jazz musician. Steve Smith, you know, he was in Journey, and he was a rocker. He's a cha cha like, trained session cat. You know, he knows all this stuff inside and out. He studied with Gary Chafee, and his, Gary Chafee's stickings are all over Steve Smith's playing. I mean, it's like all <laughs> it's written all over his phrasing. It's crazy. Um, but he's a trained guy, so he knows how to get in and out of every style. He knows the jazz. Uh, and he said to uh, Neil, man, yeah, if you want to learn some of this stuff, he's like studying with Freddie Gruber. And, of course, Weckl did as well. Uh, now, Weckl's also a trained guy. Weckl comes from that school. Weckl came more from the GAD school. So if you watch old tapes of Weckl, he was playing back on the stick, back here, which is the Gad. And again, that's not wrong. Gad does that. Uh, I think it's an old session person, a session player technique that they used to do. You don't have to hit as hard. And you, you could get a good solid backbeat for signal for, the, for you know, the recording that you're playing on. Uh, you don't have to work as hard to get signal. But it doesn't do much for rebound. Because when you're not you know, back on the stick, the stick doesn't really want to rebound. And you've got, you got to find that. So it's a little harder, harder to get. Um, so Weckl used to play back there. Now, I was a fan of Weckl, you know, in the 90s. He was the first fusion player that I was ever turned on to. That, was, that blew my mind because I was in the whole Weckl craze of uh, the early 90s when that, that album came out. That was, that was it for me. You know, I was, like, hooked on his playing. And, uh, yeah, if you watched him back to basics and stuff, he's playing back here. You know, and he had the red, the, the, the maroon sticks and all that. Around the 2000s, about 10 years later or so, when he started studying with Freddie, he started getting more into the mode of technique. He started getting more into the, the flow and, and having the stick work with you. Uh, and I feel like his playing, as good as it was before he was doing that stuff, just skyrocketed when he got into that stuff. I mean, changed his whole thing. He changed the size of his sticks. He changed, like, everything. He changed the form of his setup. Everything was different. His rising wasn't up here anymore, <laughs> up in the stratosphere. All those 80s 80 guys, he brought it down. He brought it into his form. He worked more on all that stuff. I was lucky that the guys I studied with were very much into all that stuff. So I, I, got, I got a lot of that practice uh, from watching some of those guys do it. Um, what's this saying here? Yeah. I guess the flat to uh, tom style setup of Travis is maybe because he was a marching band drummer. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's the tenor drum thing for sure. You know, it's definitely the way his drum set looks is almost like a marching setup, the way he's got it going. And, uh, and tenor drummers do tend to play in that French grip. I've seen a lot of tenor drummers play in that French grip. 
Uh, if you if there's this uh, George Martinez, who's skinny George. I don't know if skinny if George just happens to be watching on any of these uh, profiles, but he's a friend of mine on, on Instagram and on TikTok. Uh, he's I've done a bunch of duets with him. He's a tenor drummer, and he plays in that French grip. He kind of plays more an Americanized grip, but he's definitely more in that French grip. Uh, and there's it's, it's a great it's a great grip. It really lends itself to the fingers much more than the German style does. Uh, Akira, Akira Jimbo also did the Steve Gadd gripping technique. Yes, a lot of guys, especially in the 80s. It was a big thing. Jeff Picaro, if you watched him play, he was back on the stick. Uh, and some guys still do it. Um, you, know, you watch some guys, and they're great at it. It's a marching thing, it, again, to give you a big, big volume. If you watch Keith Carlock, look up a Keith Carlock video, he's still, he's still in here. And he's grooving, he's smooth when he plays. But he's still back on the stick. He's, he's, so, and and he, he gets rebound, but I don't know exactly what he's doing to get his technique so smooth like that. I don't play like that. I definitely balance this thing out. Oop, I got a low battery warning already? That's crazy. I was at 100%. See that? Apparently live eats up battery. All right, good. Yeah, any other comments here that I just don't want to miss them? Um, how about the Hurtas? Hurtas a rudiment. Yep. So Hurta wasn't, wasn't called a Hurta when I was a kid. So Hurta uh, wants to talk about it. Uh, what is this workshop on? Uh, about the workshop, I will drop a link to register. Uh, the workshop is it's a three lesson workshop, four lesson workshop actually, that, that just goes through some basic foundations of technique. Uh, it's something free I do for the community. So if you want to get in on that, check these comments when I'm done and I'll send you the registration link to uh, check it out. You could also go to my website, I think, or if you're on Instagram, you could go right to my bio and there's a link to it there too. But underneath this, I will go ahead and put the registration link if you want to check that out. Um, yeah, uh, I'm sorry, I lost my, my train of thought here. Herda, so you were talking about the Herda. Yeah, the Herda is, is it wasn't called a Herda when I was learning. It's the idea of two 30 second notes and two 16 notes. So one E N, one E N, one E N. If you do it in triplets, one triplet. So it's almost like doing diddle tap tap, which would be like almost kind of like a single drag if you did it all very even. But then instead of diddling, you alternate the diddle, and that's going to make your hands not alternate. And that would be the herder rudiment. Now I learned them as what, what uh, um, Kim Plainfield called odd roughs. He called that an odd rough. And if you look in Kim's book, uh, which is called Advanced Concepts, he's got the odd rough exercise. So he basically takes you through the odd roughs and he makes you odd rough on the accent, which is something I teach all my students all the time. That's, that's definitely a, bit, a big thing to, to get into. Uh, I love the herd. It's a great herd man. But I feel like everyone plays it in this position. This is a three. But ideally, you could play the groups of four. concept of the odd rough because it's putting the diddle, that split diddle, on any accent, not just the hurdle, which is every third note. So instead of just always doing dotted eighth notes, you can kind of put it anywhere if you understand the idea of odd roughs. So that's that's the way I teach it. I, I never taught the hurdle. I didn't find out, I didn't call them hurdas until like YouTube. I started watching YouTube and people were calling it a hurdle. And I'm assuming it's a drum corps thing I, I that they started calling it that. But growing up, I never even heard of a hurdle. It was never even a thing that, that I even heard of terminology-wise. Like a blushta. That's another one. I feel like somebody just made that up. <laughs> it's not, not really a rudiment. They just, somebody said it, and then they started calling it blushta, and that was like the name of it. Uh, and I was talking with my, my, my buddy and one of my old teachers, Dave Stark, and we had the conversation of, you know, we should just make up a bunch of rudiments, make up a bunch of silly names, and see if they catch on. Because <laughs> I feel like some people went ahead and did that. Uh, good. Uh, Vinny, what's up, buddy? I think your hands got even faster. <laughs> well, I'm still, I'm still working, man. How are you doing, buddy? I, I watch pictures of you with the wife and the, and, and, and the kid. You, you guys look great. You look great. So Vinny Constantino, if anyone remembers, I, we're going back now. But my very first YouTube video, I did a, an arrangement of Spain in my sister's basement um, with the drum set. And Alan Proto was playing bass and Vinny was playing guitar on that, that version of Spain that we did. That's my first YouTube video. It's got... 300,000 something views on it just because it was at a time when YouTube was uh, didn't have any videos on it. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> but man, this kid was 20, well, how old were you, Ben, when that happened? Um, what are you, 24, 23, when we did that video? You were a kid. And this, this kid, he listened to the, the version once, the arrangement, and then like the next take we did it, and that was it. And he like nailed it. So, yeah, amazing player. Uh, you're looking at the Sonar Jungle Kit. Yeah, you were 24 in that video. Yeah, that's what I thought. So that, that, that would have made me, what, 26? No, no I was a little older than that. Anyways, um, I still look young in that video, though. I, I look back at that video, and it's a little scary. Uh, yeah, that Sonar Jungle Kit, uh, Sonar's great. Uh, they're, they're, they're expensive. That's my, <laughs> my only problem with Sonar, is that they're quality drums. One of my snare drums is a Sonar, and that one snare drum was 1200 bucks used. So it was, uh, they're, they're expensive drums. The Jungle Kit, I don't think it's that bad. Uh, it's small, which is good if you're looking for a, a space saving type of thing. Um, but yeah, uh, the Ludwig, what's it? Look at the Sonar Jungle and the Ludwig Quest, Quest Love Kit. Uh, yeah, again, any any of those smaller kits they are, are great at that at those levels. You know, it's honestly whatever you like at that point. I mean, if you're not going for session work, if you're just looking for something to practice on, if it, between you and me, I would go used. You know, I would go ahead and find like a used kit and just and, and just do that. Or get like a bunch of used drums, and if you want a smaller size kit, um, convert. You know, so my bass drum on my kit, on all my videos, is a floor tom that I converted myself. I just got the hardware and I converted it to a bass drum to get that small size. So you could definitely do that. In fact, uh, Angelo, one of my members, uh, he just had a, a, a kit made for him. This guy's still, he's still a few weeks away from it, but he specified all the sizes, and this guy custom made him all tiny drums. Because he's got that same issue where he's in a small space. So I think it's like a 14 or 15 inch, inch kick drum. And it's shallow by like 5 inches. And everything's like super shallow. But that way you can play on a real kit. So um, yeah, man, look around. I mean, those, those that like Sonar Jungle Kit is great. I mean, it's beautiful. If you want to spend the money on it. Um, I'm always frugal. So I'm always more about finding old drums and just <laughs> fixing them up. But, uh, and of course, I endorse Pearl. So technically, I should tell everyone to get a Pearl kit. Um, so... I don't know what Pearl has as far as small kits. I think that they, they have a couple of options that are pretty good, but all, the, all those lines of kits, Sonar, Ludwig, Yamaha, Pearl, Tama, they're all gonna have a version of that jungle kit. Uh, if you're really looking for something super small, there's that Club Jordan kit, which I think is Yamaha? I could be making that up. I don't know, but that's like a stand-up kit. So you actually stand up and the bass drum pedal hits up on the, on the bottom of like the big tall floor tom. And then there's a little mini snare drum and a hat and just one suspended cymbal, and that's the entire kit. So if you're standing in the corner somewhere in a bar, you can play drums. So, yeah, man, I would love to do something. I, I, I was telling Al the other day that we should call Vinny and redo, do a redux on that Spain video and do it like however many, 15 years later or whatever it is, and uh, get a different version of it. I think that would be really, really hip. But, okay, what else we got here? Uh, let's see. Hey Luke, how we doing? All right, so when you're practicing with the practice pad, what is the size of the sticks you use? That's a great question. Okay, let's go back a little bit. I'm gonna to get to that, but one second, okay. Good blues running backbeat. How about the hurdles? Okay, we did that one. Using Steve Gadd technique, uh, use, with the Steve Gadd technique of hand technique, I'm, I'm, I think I'm uh, missing something there. Yeah, so that, that's, that's with the Steve Gadd technique, again, that's going back to that, that back position. Because Gadd was a marching drummer, too. And a lot of marching drummers played that way. It was a little bit more physical way of playing. Kim Plainfield played that way. He used to make me play that way as well, uh, on purpose, because I was so dependent on the molar thing when I was younger. Mommy. Hold on one second. Sweetheart? Mommy. Daddy, Daddy's on a lesson. Can you go upstairs? Mommy. She's up there. Go find her. Oh, I'm sure she's up here. Okay, come here, come here. You can't be by yourself. You want to say hi to the internet? You want to say hi to everybody on, online? No? <laughs> Always a dad. Never ends. Yeah, Vinny knows what I'm talking about. You just wait, Vin. That's what's in your future. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> hey, Rick. How you doing? Rick's another one of my students. Great, great drummer. Uh, the hip gate, Yamaha hip gate kit. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's another good one. Uh, let's see. Now, what was that other question about practice pads? What are the size of the sticks that you use? Okay, so th this is a great question. Uh, I do not ever use one size of sticks. 
Okay, I, I try to change up my sticks as much as I can. I never get married to one size of one pair. Once one pair starts feeling great and super comfortable, I change, I switch. Um, the reason for that is, you know, it, it tricks your muscles. And the more confusion your muscles have, like if you watch P90X commercials, the more confused your muscles are, the more they're, technically they're gonna grow. Uh, so I'll use a light stick when I do some of these exercises. I'll use, you know, core masters, which are like the big drum core sticks. I even have a set of like one pound steel metal sticks. You can't use them for much, just some, some pad exercises and they'll, they'll, they'll destroy your drums. But uh, these sticks are a stick that one of my students sent me. These are custom handmade, uh, beautiful drumsticks. So I've been using these for like the past few videos. Uh, and the guy's name, if you look up Brian Keithley on Facebook, he's the guy that's uh, making these by hand. And if you ever wanna get a good, like a really nice thing for a drummer, even, not even to play them, just even to have them, because they're just really nice to have. They're beautiful. But they feel amazing. So I don't know what kind of wood he used. So I gotta kinda hook up with him and ask him, because they're heavy. They're super, super heavy for a wood stick. But they're skinny. And I'm used to kind of like, you know, again, a core master is really fat. Um, but yeah, so my, the quick answer is use as many different kinds of sticks as you, as you can. You don't want to be in a position where you're sitting in with somebody and you don't have a pair of drum sticks. You pick up their little toothpicks and you're not used to it. And you're like, oh, I can't play with these sticks. You never want to be in a position where you're like, I can't play because of the equipment, if that makes sense. All right, so by varying the sticks, I can play with anything. It doesn't really matter what kind of sticks are there. Um, and again, anything I say, some guys might agree, some guys might disagree, every teacher's different. Uh, you just gotta take the information that makes sense to you and adopt it. I, I've, I've had so many teachers uh, when I was growing up and studying drums, uh, and I learned that, that rule, that even when teachers disagreed, whoops, lost my iPad. Even when they disagreed, um, I was always able to take what made sense to me and then adopt that philosophy. So anything I say, if you don't agree with it, don't do it. You know, there's no right or wrong. Just look at what different drummers have to say and decide for yourself if it makes sense or not. Okay, are you familiar with all the secret Chiefs 3? Uh, no. There are some really fascinating, confusing rhythms in a lot of their music uh, that I'd love to hear your opinion on. I'll definitely check them out. You know, if you could drop me a link, that would be even better. Uh, shoot me a link in, in the comments of this video when it's all done. Uh, I'll certainly check them out, you know. I'm always down for checking out new music if it's something I'm, I haven't been turned on, you know, turned on to. So I appreciate all these guys doing that. When I've been doing the Brazilian stuff, you know, which is arguably stuff I haven't done in a long time, I just start doing it more for YouTube. Uh, you're getting all these Brazilian cats coming into the comments, turning me on to all this great Brazilian music. Um, and it, it's, it's really, really, really hit. So I love it when people, you know, give me suggestions of things to listen to. It's a very cool thing. Uh, oh man, I didn't <laughs> we'll pull my mic guitar. <laughs> Dude, you were a kid. You were a 24-year-old kid. You did amazing on that video. And again, that was just like, supposed to be like a, a master's audition for me. You know, it wasn't even supposed to be something that I was going to release on YouTube. Well, YouTube wasn't even a thing back then. So, um, don't worry about it, man. You sound great on that. And again, you, you were a kid, all of us. I mean, there's even a moment where I think Al, Al was like out of tune. But you know what? The music is music. It doesn't have to be perfect. You know, music's not meant to be perfect. It's meant to be played by humans. And jazz especially. Jazz, you can get away with the sound being whatever. And honestly, I think the guitar tone is fine. I think a lot of it had to do with how we mix the sound afterwards anyway. You might not have had any control over that. So we probably went direct into some really bad Pro Tools system and EQ'd it badly, because uh, I'd suck at that. So whoever did that was either me or, or Grummy that did the sound there. So dude, don't beat yourself up over a video that's that old. Uh, you sound amazing. Uh, I only reached 90 BPM on Paradrill 30 second notes. How about you? Um, I'm clocking it, I mean, I haven't clocked it in a while. I think that we clocked it a little while ago because I did something with Skinny George and we were talking about Paradiddles and on his live, he was doing a live thing and he had his up somewhere around 2.30 uh, and I think I was trying it. I mean, 2.30 was pretty hot for me. Um, of course, that would, be, that would be 16 notes at 2.30. That would be a 30 second notes. So, um, but yeah, so I'd be like 115, 30 second notes if you're doing it up there. 120 is probably pushing it for me if I was gonna go. And again, it's great great to get your power drills fast, great to get rudiments fast, but just don't get wrapped up in fast being the end-all be-all. Fast is just a matter of developing your muscles. So the faster you go, the stronger your muscles are. I'm mean, sure, the more things you can do. But you have to understand when you get into technique like rhythm accents and sticking, is that rhythms are rhythms. So to the listener, 
Do they know that you're doing 30 second notes? Do they know that you're doing an open roll? Do they know that you're doing single strokes? All they hear are fast notes, you know? So sticking allowed you to, you know, get those notes to happen. And that's the beauty of having different sticking solutions for different tempos, all right? So I don't, I don't get too wrapped up in, you know, man, my single strokes aren't as fast as this guy or this guy on the internet is playing at 300 BPM and his singles are amazing. That's great, you know, that's like power lifting. But to me, it's like, unless you're a metal drummer where you're doing that, uh, it's, not, it's not a realistic goal that you have to worry about. You know, you, you could, I'm not saying don't push yourself and don't try to get faster, but understand that if you see a guy going faster than you, it doesn't mean he's a better player because he's faster. Faster is not the end all be all, okay? All right, good night, it's 2.30. <laughs> good night to you. Thank you for joining me, I appreciate it. And, uh, and you know what, I'm gonna, that's pretty much it for me. I'm supposed to go an hour and I'm already uh, a little bit over and I have a student coming in in about 15 minutes, so I do gotta wrap it up myself. But yo, this was a great hang. Thank you guys for, for everyone taking part and I don't know if I missed any questions on Insta. I haven't I've been ignoring you guys, so sorry about that. Um, but yeah, this is gonna be a replay on all three of these networks. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and post this video up to Facebook, to YouTube, and up to Instagram, along with the link to register for my workshop that I'm doing now. So as soon as this live is over, that's the first thing I'll do in the comments and in the descriptions. I'll put the register link in there so you guys can take part, all right? So lesson three is gonna drop on Sunday in the morning, and then you'll have a whole other week to still go through it while I open uh, the doors up to the Drummer's Almanac. So. You guys have plenty of time to go through it, but definitely go through it because it's a great free resource no matter what you decide to do. You know, go through it. It's a really, really cool thing to be. It really helped me change and shape my playing. So uh, definitely take advantage of that. All right. Thanks, everybody. And uh, I'll see you on the next one, which should be probably Sunday or Monday. All right. Have a good day. Let's see if I can figure out how to do this.